Welcome to Writer's Life, an ongoing conversation with writers, authors, and folks in the publishing industry. I'm your host, Marvel Harrison, Publishing Director, Members Press of Western New Mexico University. It's a pleasure to share a conversation today with Peter Reaver of International Transactions, a literary agency founded with his wife, Sandra Ann. Together, they have specialized in international idea and intellectual property brokerage, catering to multinational, multilingual licensing and rights representatives of authors and publishers, as well as producing award-winning television and other media. I also dug a little bit deep and found that over the last past 50 years, Peter has produced games, nearly a dozen TV documentaries, art exhibits around the world, global expeditions. It seems no endeavor is out of your reach. Welcome to Writer's Life, Peter. Well, when you get old, I guess there's a long list of things you've done. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, well, out of your vast array of experiences, I'm curious to start, and you can take this conversation pretty much anywhere. Uh, I'm curious about how you became a literary agent. Well, um, the thing is, when I left UCLA Film School, um, I joined the BBC Apprentice Program in London principally because I wanted to be back with uh, my uh, girlfriend who uh, subsequently became my wife. And um, while I was working for the BBC, I was a gopher. And um, gopher is a guy, go for this, go for that. You know, <laughs> and I worked for a guy called Ian McNaughton, who was a producer of the lowest rated television show in British history. Um, <laughs> it was opposite the nine o'clock news on BBC Two. Um, and only when it was in repeats two years or a year and a half later um, did it actually take off worldwide and it's Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> but my, my, jo my job had nothing to do with creative. My job, well, that's not true. I did have to, as a gopher, my job was to go and find the ladies of the night who are willing to dress up as nuns and bare their breasts in the penguin tennis sketch, that kind of thing. Um, but b basically, it it was fun to work with all those guys, and I, every once in a while, I meet some of them, and they sort of remember me, which is kind of flattering. I, I think that um, my father was in licensing uh, when he came out of, he was a scenic designer in New York in the 50s. That's where I grew up in the 50s, and um, he was licensing um, toys and games that he invented after that, and he asked me for some help, and the guys from Monty Python, they were in summer break and broke, and they wanted to do a book. And since dad knew about licensing, he sort of learned by osmosis. I suggested that they find a publisher and license them the book, and then they did a book, and the rest was history. Um, I went on and living in London, I went on and I did character merchandising for things like Star Trek and a lot of television shows like Chips and all that stuff back in the 70s. And then uh, in 81, I turned pretty much full time in New York to uh, licensing books and becoming a literary agent. Working in the art field more than anything else, Peter Beard was a client, mm -hmm. uh, Franco Fontana. I worked with uh, Bob Rauschenberg and, and Hockney and people like that, helping them get books done. And, and, and also festivals, um, in ph photographic festivals around the world. I did a lot of those. And I got involved with NASA and did a, um, a book with uh, that Knopf published in 85 called Sightseeing, in which we um, got permission to unfreeze flight footage. And we found 175,000 images that had never been seen by the astronauts, let alone published. And um, we put together an exhibit that opened, and in fact, is still touring worldwide. It's the um, Barbara Hitchcock was the curator. She was from the Polaroid collection. She did the, the artwork. Um, I did the production work. Um, and uh, there are twin exhibits, and they're still touring worldwide. In fact, it's the number one art photographic exhibit ever mounted, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, but I got involved I in, I, I, you know, since then, I've always sort of stayed interested in the space program and aviation and things like that. I was brought up in a family of creative people. My mother was a television actress. My grandmother's a film actress. My father was a scene designer and toy inventor and game inventor and stuff. And for me, uh, the, the possibilities of 
being involved in something always becomes um, a, a search for what really interests me. I've never been very good at selling something I'm not interested in or promoting something I'm not interested in personally. So in that sense, I'm a dilettante. Um, and you know, some authors have shown me books that I said, man, that's gonna sell, but it's not something I wanna do. And they come back later on and say, see, we told you it would sell. And I said, no, I knew it would sell. It's just not, you know. And projects run that way too. Um, when I did the, uh, the Voyage Around the World flight in 84, 85, 86, um, I was the project manager in the end and uh, fundraiser and floor sweeper and so on. Um, I'm really proud that it sits in the Air and Space Museum in Washington the plane and it was the first circumnavigation of the globe non-stop non-refueled and uh, meeting with uh, Ronald Reagan and Nancy and getting the medals for the pilots I thought it was a great thing um, but you know uh, again it was something I was interested in so I followed it through and and helped make it happen um, you know there are people who are singularly creative I, I house I grew up in next door, Mark Rothko lived there. And there's a man who was singularly creative. There was nobody else influencing his work, um, except my father who introduced him to rollers and, you know, painting rollers. And dad said, <laughs> God, he's going to make bigger and bigger paintings. Uh, but, but that's, that's a family joke. Um, <clears throat> but the, the fact is that um, when you're around people who are really singularly creative, you, you, become an adjunct to that, but you don't take credit for their creativity. You, you allow them to express themselves. And sometimes you channel them in a way that is going to support their adventures or ventures. And, and, and certainly sometimes you hope gonna generate some money. So your creativity is really creating the milieu where other people can shine. Sometimes, quite often. I mean, I am enjoying writing, but that's, really, um, that's such a hedonistic enterprise. It's a lot of fun. I love it. It's escapism. Um, I do, um, I don't know, I've written four or five books. I got two on the way now. Um, they, they are snippets of my life and snippets of adventures that I've been privy to that I am able to put into page turning storytelling, but I no illusions of literacy masterpiece whatsoever. It's basically a book you would read on the beach and give to somebody as you leave the beach. I mean, it's kind of kind of the writing that I do, but I do that for myself. It's fun. Um, I have done, and I'm proud of some of the things that I've done, uh, negotiated the first global environmental treaty between the USA and USSR in, in 92. Um, Was that in the, that would have been in the George H administration? Right. Um, it, we did it at the UN and the purpose was to do a show and tell. Um, it was Earth Day and it was the celebration of this, you know, anniversary of Earth Day in 92. And I was on the environment program in the UN advising them. And I said, look, bouncing balls in the park really don't teach anybody anything. You've got the headquarters of the United Nations here. Everybody's going to be in town. Why don't we do a show and tell for them and their families to show them what the world really is? So we did what we call the only one earth ceremony. And that was our, the, the treaty that was signed by the USA and USSR had three words, only one earth. Stop thinking there's another one we're gonna go to in a hurry. You've got this one and that's it, don't wreck it. Um, and so th that was the purpose. And we got 40 astronauts and cosmonauts come from around the world lecture the delegates. We did a live transmission from space, from the Mir space station, um, and did a recorded transmission from the, from the Columbia at that time, not the Columbia, the, um, yeah, it was Columbia, Columbia at that time, the shuttle. And, and just to sort of make the ambassadors in the UN and their families, the kids are always important, to realize that what they think the earth is, isn't at all. Seen from space, you have that perspective. So I was pleased to do that. Um, and, you know, also being the grandson of Dietrich, you know, and I'm the guy in the family, as my mother always says, I'm the macha, the guy who has to do it. Um, you know, he's the, the, 
the producer and the family. Um, when my grandmother died, I had to take charge of her archive and her memorabilia and all the rest of that, and I still do. Um, the real talent in my family is always artistic talent of, between the four brothers. It's always my brother, Michael. He was a great art director and production designer in Hollywood. If people look up at the, the films that he husbanded along and did the designs for and everything, it's really starting from Brubaker and Ordinary People all the way through Iron Man. It's just, his last film was Django Unchained. Michael had a tremendous artistic talent, which I think he got from my father and, and certainly my mother. Well, that's interesting transition for Michael to take that on after your dad had been a set designer yeah. way back when. I mean, yeah. long before any of those ordinary people kinds of productions were being done. Yeah, dad, dad had no interest in motion pictures. He loved the theater and and he was early in television. He, he designed a lot of television commercials, the art design of the television commercials. Uh, he was the first guy to take an automobile off the road and he put it in a studio and had this gleaming piece of sculpture coming down a ramp. And then he took Frigidaires out of the kitchen. He put them on the beach with a woman with a flowing scarf to show you how beautiful Frigidaire, your life with Frigidaire is gonna be. I mean, dad had this imagination, but my favorite one of all is the Anison commercial where he did this cartoon cut out of the anvil and the head and the lightning. And the, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, dad was inventive, but growing up with that in New York, Michael and I had, had uh, access to his creativity. And, you know, Michael, I'm not never surprised Michael became a scene designer or art director, production designer, because every Christmas, my father would lock us out of a room in the house and for the month of December, he would transform that room into a secret environment. Uh, one year we had a forest with um, trompe l'oeil paintings on the walls and, and clouds in the ceiling and birch trees and leaves. And the bed was like a tree house. And the next year, every year was different. Next year, we had a cowboy room with driftwood and rubber rocks on the floor and a, a red lamp uh, campfire and um, trompe l'oeil of the desert where I live now. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, and our favorite thing, of course, was the, the door to the bathroom that was part of the room um, was done as an outhouse. He <laughs> did a painting of it being an outhouse. And, and so I grew up with that and that kind of imagination and everything. So I wasn't surprised Michael, um, who had more artistic talent than I do, took off in that direction. Well, the Riva household home uh -huh. sounds like a very busy. very intriguing busy place and i can appreciate where production came out of that and i like the idea that you have the heart and the mindset to be able to be comfortable in letting other people shine and yeah, no i mean look there's nothing more attractive than somebody being productive and creative. I mean, it's a great thing. I, I've, I've known a lot of really frustrated artists and you just point them a little bit in a different direction and boom, they're happier than the heck. And why not make somebody happy by, uh, you know, Bob Rauschenberg was frustrated with the photography he was doing. Nobody in any of the museums in New York was in, interested. And I said to him, well, why don't we do a show in the Rencontre Internationale de la Photographie in Arles in France they love what you're doing. And he had one photograph that was 40 meters long. One. 40 meters long, 30 inches high. And I found a place. We made an aluminum frame to hang it on. And it ran around this old monastery. And he loved it. It was a sensation. It was great. And, you know. And did that um, lead you to be the citizen, uh, an honorary citizen? Yeah. <laughs> that, that that year that year I was busy. I had four productions at the at the festival in Arles. Uh, one of them was NASA and Bob Rauschenberg and and David Hockney and I think there was a something from Lartigue as well and and Franco Fontana. I I mean, just if anybody ever wants to go to the best photographic art festival in the world, there is nothing like it anywhere else. It's between the Fourth of July and the Bastille Day on the nineteenth. It's in Arles in the south of France. And I guarantee you that'll be the best two weeks you ever spent in your life. 
Well, Peter, I want to go with you, given that you're the honorary <laughs> citizen there. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, one day I'll find the time to go back again. I haven't been back since early 90s, but they, you okay. know, they're, they're great people. They're, they're really wonderful. And it's a great, great holiday festival. I mean, you, you, every evening there are presentations in the Roman amphitheater. You sit in a Roman amphitheater watching these projections of some of the greatest photographers in the world. It, it's spectacular. Well, wonderful. I'm, I'm happy to know that you had a hand in that and that they were able to reciprocate in terms of recognizing wow. how and who you were in the production of it all. It's a way for them to say thank you for working for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> excuse me, it works for me. So um, I want to go back a little bit to being, um, you mentioned about people sending you a book and you're saying, yeah, this is a good book. It's going to sell. I'm not interested in it because I need to have the passion to spend my time and energy and resources on it. But what do you, what do you look for in a book or a script? Well, everything has to be personal to me. Okay. Um, it, it has to affect me personally. Um, I, you know, it's hard to quantify exactly what that is. If I had a magic answer, I'd probably be making a ton more money because I'd only ask for certain projects. But I, I think the truth is excellence matters. Okay. Um, the author's ability to communicate clearly um, and how well crafted something is makes a big difference. You know, books have to be written with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in that process, you have to make sure that the end has links to the middle, has links to the beginning. And there are threads in a book and character development in the book, whether it be fiction or nonfiction. You have to be able to nurture those threads all the way through the story, not in a clunky way, but in a seamless, integrated way, so that the reader is taken on a voyage with you and comes to the conclusion. You know, somebody asked me a long time ago, you know, if I had a definition of art. And I and and you know, without being a professor at all, I can tell you my definition of art is extreme generosity. If you stand in front of a Francis Bacon painting, even though it's sometimes sincerely ugly and terrorizing sometimes his paintings. Nevertheless, that painting is washing over you. It's coming at you. Picasso comes at you. You stand in front of Wernicke as I did as a kid, that thing just washes over you. It, Van Gogh's the same thing. Renoir is the same thing. All the great painters, it, it just exudes this impact on you all the time. That generosity, that impact is what you need from a book. The, the perfect case in point is Stieg Larsson. Stieg Larsson was Scandinavia's number one investigative journalist, was writing about topics that were really politically sensitive. I mean, stuff that uh, you know was right on the fringe of getting himself assassinated by you know serious crooks and, and mafiosi and things like that. He was a great investigative journalist, but he was a total absolute workaholic, drinking, smoking, all the time. And the editor who he, he knew in the same, in, lived in the same building as him, uh, Per Faustino of Norstedt's, I was Norstedt's uh, agent and advisor in America. Per Faustino tells the story that one day uh, Stieg Larsson gets in the elevator with him and says, you know, in my free time, I've written a, a book. I, would you mind reading it? And first of all, in Paris head, he said, this guy had free time. We know he's a workaholic. How did he ever have? OK, but of course, he said, yes, I'd be glad to read it. And, and, and Stieg says, but it's a novel. And Pear thought, that's kind of strange from him. But OK, I'll read it. Two days later, Stieg gets in the elevator. There's Pear in the elevator. He says, oh, I brought this for you. And he hands him a plastic shopping bag with 1,500 pages, closely typeset, one manuscript. 1,500 pages. And Pear goes, oh dear, this is not going to end well. So Pear goes back to his office. And of course, he says, I have to start reading it. And he started reading it. He ordered lunch. He ordered dinner. He <laughs> stayed on overnight. 
He had breakfast, lunch in his office before he finished. And he said, it's magnificent, but it's unpublishable. It's way too big, way too long. And Pear spent the next six or eight weeks dividing it into three books. Ah. And, and then it was launched in Sweden and in Scandinavia and so forth. Was that, was that his idea to... You had to split it up. You, you couldn't publish a book that's that big. You, you, you know, you look at each one of the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and so on. You look at those three volumes, you'd have one book that's this wide. It, yeah. it, you, I, I just was curious, though, was it, you know, who drove the idea that, okay, this is too much. Well, we, physically, because... physically, he had to split it. Okay. Okay. So, so what he did is he split up the stories and Steak said, yeah, I'll go along with it. Go ahead and edit and I'll read. And if I approve your edit, that's fine. And Steak said, yeah, what you did is fine. So they published it and it's a huge success. And I'm showing it around publishers in America. Now, bear in mind, it already sold 4 million copies in six months in Scandinavia. 4 <laughs> million copies. It, it, I mean, huge numbers. A lot of zeros. Right. So I'm showing it to publishers here who are going, nah, you know, it, 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 the American audience and the female, you know, protagonist, and we're not really sure. And the, uh, finally, Sonny took it at, at Knopf and before he could get it into print, Steak passes away. So now he's got a book that he loves and he wants to launch and the author's dead. And how do you handle that? And the guy called Paul Bogarts, who was the head of publicity at Knopf, brilliant man, he made two decisions. One, he was gonna send a thousand postcards out to every mom and pop book club in America, saying on the postcard, this book is coming, sold so many copies in Europe, if you return this postcard to, to us before the pub date, we will send you a free copy. So he ended up sending out like 800 free copies. Simultaneously, Paul Bogarts went every Friday afternoon down to the bus that goes to Long Island where all the rich people live at the end. Called, it's called the Jitney, the Long Island Jitney. Mm -hmm. And he took a box of books and he handed them to people getting onto the bus. And he built word of mouth that way. The New York Times published a review of Girl with a Dragon Tattoo and called Stieg Larsson a misogynist and panned the book. Clearly never read the book. But because the word of mouth was already out, newspapers across the country with all these mom and pop book clubs, they made reviews in every newspaper around the country. And New York Times had to do a second review retracting the first one. <laughs> so, you know, when you have people who want to support something that's excellent and find a way to do it. That's a joy. Watching what Paul Bogarts did and, and the safeguards he put in place for this, this author and, and the work was wonderful. Was I proud to be have a hand in it? Sure. But more importantly, it's a great book. And, and by the way, people read it. Oh, it's a great page turner. It's exciting. Yeah, read it again. There's stuff in there that politicians and heavy business people in Scandinavia still don't dare leave their house because they're so ashamed that in a way he exposed them. Because it was a novel, but it was all based on fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which uh, makes exposing fact a very interesting um, yep. modality. It's well, I have a book being written at the moment by a wonderful author, David Ariosto, uh, and he's got a co-author, Ali Velshi, who's on TV, and they're doing a book for Vicki Wilson at Knopf on space mm -hmm. and and the things that he has uncovered about the men and women in laboratories and design studios and things around this nation and around the world in fact the chinese and the russians and the americans and the french and the germans i mean the stuff he's finding out absolutely have uh, riveted me to the core. I mean, I'm just so excited about that book. It'll come out in about two years. It's absolutely remarkable, but that's why you do the job. Well, I'm glad you're out there doing that job, Peter, because you have brought us many wonderful experiences around the globe. And, you know, thank you for taking the time today. It's been a joy to speak oh. with you, Peter. And oh, thank so everyone who has joined us. I'm Marvel Harrison, and from all of us at Members Press, may your day be sparked with curiosity and wonder. See you again on the Thank next you, Writer's Life. Thank you, Peter.
Bye-bye. <laughs>